To begin this swearing-in ceremony of the members of the 29th Canadian Ministry, please rise and welcome the Minister's designate, the Prime Minister, and the Governor-General of Canada. For debuter cette ceremonie d'assumentation des membres de la Lutheran Conseil des ministres canadiens, vous allez vous lever et accueillir les ministres designés. Le Premier ministre et la Gouverneur Générale du Canada. Please be seated. We vous asseoir. The Clerk of the Privy Council will now seek the Governor General's consent to proceed. La Graffière du Conseil Privé demandera maintenant à la Gouverneur Générale la permission de procéder. With the Governor General's approval, we will now proceed with the ceremony. Maintenant que la Gouverneur Générale a signé son approval, nous procéderons à la ceremony. The ministers who are privy councillors and who are changing responsibilities will please come forward to take the oath of office. Les ministres qui sont membres de conseil privé et qui changent de responsabilité sont priés de s'avancer pour prêter le serment d'office. The Honorable Philomena Tassi, Minister Responsible for the Federal Economic Development Agency for Southern Ontario. L'Honorable Philomena Tassi, Minister Responsable de l'Agence Fédérale de Développement Économique pour le Sud de l'Ontario. I, Philomena Tassi, do solemnly and sincerely promise and swear that I will truly and faithfully, and to the best of my skill and knowledge, execute the powers and trusts reposed in me as Minister Responsible for the Federal Economic Development Agency for Southern Ontario, so help me God. Thank you. The Honorable Elena Jazek, Minister of Public Services and Procurement. L'Honorable Elena Jazek, Ministre des Services Publics et de l'Approvisionnement. Elena Jazek, do solemnly and sincerely promise and declare that I will truly and faithfully, and to the best of my skill and knowledge, execute the powers and trusts reposed in me as Minister of Public Services and Procurement. Moi, Elena Jacek, je promets et déclare solennellement et sincèrement qu'au mieux de ma compétence et de ma connaissance, j'exécuterai loyalement et fidèlement le pouvoir et je m'acquitterai des responsabilités qui m'ont été confiées en qualité de ministre des services publics et de l'approvisionnement. The Governor General, the Prime Minister, and the Clerk of the Privy Council will now sign the oath book. 
La gouverneure générale, le premier ministre et la graffière de conseil privé opposeront maintenant leur signature sur le registre des serments. Ladies and gentlemen, to conclude the ceremony, please join me in congratulating the members of the 29th Canadian Ministry. Mesdames et Messieurs, pour terminer la ceremonie, applaudissons les membres de 29 e Conseil des Ministres. Thank you for being here today at Rideau Hall. Merci de votre présence ici à Rideau Hall aujourd'hui. Merci. All right, Peter Van Dusen watching along with you. A minor, as you have seen, cabinet shuffle uh, taking place this morning at Rideau Hall. A st straight line swap uh, between uh, Philomena Tassi and Helena Jacek. And, uh, this being done, uh, we are told, uh, because of uh, family health issues involving uh, Philomena Tassi's family, and we might get uh, a little more detail on, on that, although it's a private family matter, so perhaps not very much more detail. Uh, but uh, we're going to get uh, more information when the Prime Minister in the next uh, 10 minutes or so uh, meets, uh, meets with reporters along, uh, we're told, with the two cabinet ministers. So, Helena Jacek, uh, who uh, was the minister for the... Uh, Economic Development Agency for Southern Ontario now, now takes over the massive portfolio of procurement. And Philomena Tassi, uh, these are two Ontario MPs, two Ontario cabinet ministers. She uh, turns over uh, that, uh, that portfolio of procurement uh, and public works and, uh, to Helena Jacek, and uh, she takes on Helena Jacek's portfolio of uh, economic development for Southern Ontario. Uh, so we're standing by here uh, from the Prime Minister uh, and the two cabinet ministers on that. But uh, Martin Stringer is watching along with me. And so w let's talk about Helena Jacek because she now assumes this uh, very uh, big portfolio in the federal government. She uh, is a former Ontario cabinet minister, we know. She's a, a doctor. She's a, a former health minister in Ontario. And what's the significance of this swap, do you think? And why has the prime minister tapped her? Well, he's tapped someone with a lot of experience, as you mentioned. I mean, she was 11 years in both the Dalton McGuinty and the uh, uh, Kathleen Wynne uh, Liberal governments in Ontario. At one point, she was health minister. Uh, she is currently also the vice chair of the Treasury Board here in Ottawa, and that is a significant economic portfolio. As you mentioned, she's got a background in medicine. She's a, a, a physician. Uh, she's also though, got a background in, uh, in health economics, and that uh, was very prominent during the pandemic uh, 
uh, on the health committee. So she has a double background of both economic, uh, the economic chops as well as medical expertise. And that fits in really, really well for this massive portfolio she's taking over of uh, public services and procurement. Because a lot of our viewers will remember that recently procurement has been in the news for the hundreds of millions of dollars that was spent uh, during the pandemic on vaccines, on PPE, on personal protective equipment, on new equipment like ventilators. And there's still much uh, spending being done on health, uh, on health matters. But also she's taking over responsibility for two of the largest capital expenditure programs in Canadian history. One of them is the, the Canadian shipbuilding strategy. And the other is, of course, the last announcement by Philomena Tassi. Last big announcement was the uh, CF-35s, which are going to be replacing the, the F-18. So, so a big spending portfolio. Let me just tell you, so we'll, we were uh, looking, talking about the possibility of more information. So Philomena Tassi herself has, now, has issued a statement on social media. Uh, talking about uh, the change and the uh, different roles she's assuming and, and giving us a sense of uh, why this was important for her to uh, take on uh, this uh, you know, smaller portfolio, if I can put it that way. Uh, she writes, early last year my husband suffered two strokes. As anyone whose family's had a similar experience will know, post-stroke care can be complex and filled with uncertainty. Because of this, I met with the Prime Minister last month to discuss balancing the needs of my family with the travel demands on me as Minister of Public Services and Procurement, a department uh, with operations in every corner of the country. As Minister of the Federal Economic Development Agency for Southern Ontario, I'll continue to help create more opportunities for Canadians and their businesses while also being able to remain closer to home during this time. She goes on to thank the Prime Minister, but there, uh, that's the in, uh, some of the information and, and background on the the reason for the the change in uh, these two portfolios today and uh, important part of that statement uh, uh, Martin both of you and I have dealt with uh, senior members of our family and care and, and point and as a many many Canadians across the country have and are doing and uh, you know political representatives are no different and Philomena make uh, Tassie making the case here that yeah. because of the uh, uh, uncertainty around care that her husband will require that uh, she needs to offload some of these responsibilities uh, but clearly uh, from the Prime Minister's perspective and the government's perspective still an important voice in cabinet and so she remains in cabinet but as I've said uh, with this uh, less significant uh, I want to be careful how I frame it because all of all the positions are significant but in terms of workload this one less significant uh, than uh, the uh, portfolio of the Ministry of Procurement and uh, Public Services. Uh, so there, we have some information yeah. on why now. And that raises an interesting point too, because there's much going to be said, much has been said, and much will be said about when will we see a bigger cabinet shuffle and all that. But that underlines the point that cabinet shuffles are brought about for several reasons, many reasons, and the prime minister is responding, as you say, to a very human. Uh, these cabinet ministers are human, and he's responding to a human need of one of his ministers. And this is then a minor shift, which is ref reflecting a very personal thing in terms of larger strategic shuffles. That remains to be seen. That may come in the coming months when we'll see that. And there's been lots of discussion around that. I mean, uh, uh, you know, Ottawa in the summertime when the House of Commons is not sitting and Parliament's not sitting is, uh, you know, uh, the rumour mill churns. And so a lot of people had been uh, giving some thought to would there be a, a year into uh, a, a new mandate in a minority parliament with the, the deal with the NDP ongoing and some uh, question around how solid that deal might be if the government doesn't deliver on some more key demands of the NDP, including dental care. Uh, but the conversation had been around would there be a larger shuffle. This seems to suggest, uh, and, and uh, timing's important as well because it comes ahead of a cabinet retreat next week and then a full caucus retreat ahead of the return of parliament on September 19th. Uh, but this seems to suggest that uh, the prime minister and uh, those around him are satisfied with the front bench they have now and are going to go into the next parliament with it, yeah. barring something uh, dramatic mm -hmm. in the next couple of weeks. Well, that's right, Peter, because, I mean, as you mentioned, this is a political town, and we've all heard talk about how, whether the prime minister might want to shuffle his cabinet after a long, difficult summer economically and all that, or whether he might want to shuffle his cabinet in response to the new conservative leader when he is chosen, he or she is chosen on September 10th. Uh, the suggestion, as you say, I mean, this is a, a minor shift. This is an adjustment that he's made, uh, and we will see. Uh, the, the Prime Minister has shuffled his cabinet once, uh, which he, uh, he openly said was in response to uh, external situations, and that was faced with the, uh, the NAFTA negotiations, and he made a shift, and he said that was clearly to respond to Donald Trump and the very changing climate there, but as to whether he will make a shift or a shuffle in response to, uh, in response to the new Conservative leader, that's the question that still remains to be answered. Yeah, 
that's something to watch for. Uh, you would think that if uh, there was going to be a cabinet shuffle of more significance in the next couple of weeks before Parliament returns, exactly. this would have been the opportunity exactly. where it could happen. Yeah. Uh, but what we have today, uh, uh, to repeat, is this, uh, two ministers swapping portfolios, two ministers from Ontario, two MPs from Ontario uh, changing portfolios. Um, uh, Philomena Tassi from P Procurement moves to the uh, agency for um, economic development in, in southern Ontario and Helena Jasek, a former Ontario Liberal cabinet minister, a medical doctor, moves to the portfolio of procurement and public services that was held by Philomena Tassi. Uh, again, the timing issue around all of this, uh, you know, it comes in the, in the context of, uh, you know, uh, not this weekend but next, the Conservative leader will be revealed. Yeah. Uh, all indications are it that's, that's going to be Pierre Polyev unless something interesting happens in that, in that numbers yeah. game that involves the Conservative voting system. So uh, no big retooling ahead of that, exactly. it would seem, of the, of the Liberal cabinet. And uh, lots of questions around uh, the Prime Minister's appetite to take on Pierre Polyev, yeah. which is something he, if he wins, we will see in the new Parliament. Yeah. And a lot of people have been wondering, will he respond to the new Conservative leader, or as you suggested, uh, or will he sort of say that, no, I'm going to respond to my own agenda, and that is the agenda of, of addressing certain pan, post-pandemic problems, the economy and things like that. Uh, is, has he, is he giving a vote of confidence to the ministers who are in, in very key positions, for example, the Transport Minister Omar Al-Gabra and the, uh, and the Finance Minister Christian Freeland, who's touring the country, will be hearing from her again today in Alberta. Uh, is, is he basically going to wait for a while? And as you mentioned, there's also that in the constellation of political concerns is the, the, uh, the issue of uh, having an agreement with the NDP uh, arguably for the next two and a half years, two years, uh, to help the survival of his government. So it, it, that's very much an open question in Ottawa, being such a political town, as to whether he should see any need to have a further larger cabinet shuffle in the, in the coming right. days. And, and people look at leaders, but it's also a whole of, uh, government conversation as well. Uh, the Prime Minister apparently satisfied with this front bench. and. When you, you know, been watching the, the Conservative campaign, and particularly the, the, the proposals and comments of Pierre Paul, you have there, they're vastly different uh, yeah. than where the Trudeau Liberals have been running and, and would continue to run and the path they would continue to take. So there's this yeah. uh, very obvious uh, gulf in approaches uh, uh, to government and the value of government that we're hearing and, and government agencies that we're hearing in, in the debate. So uh, it sets up this very, uh, you know, yeah. uh, you know, different conversation with two very different points of view of how the country should be run. And uh, Prime mm -hmm. Minister seems content that this is yeah. the front bench that he's prepared to put up against a Conservative front bench with Pierre Polyev mm -hmm. as a leader. And the other political messaging, and the Prime Minister is aware of this, and that is when you change the cabinet, and especially if you change high-profile cabinet ministers, uh, that is often seen as a vote of a vote of non-confidence or a change of policy. And so if he's convinced uh, or if he's arguing that he that the, his current government, that the Liberal government is on course, uh, then it's hard to justify major uh, personnel changes in some of the key portfolios uh, like foreign affairs and uh, and econ and finance and things like that so uh, yeah very interesting and as you mentioned all of this had to be dealt with as well before next week's cabinet meeting in Vancouver uh, it helps to have those these two ministers in their new portfolios uh, getting uh, familiarized with their, their their files their papers and uh, before the the cabinet meets uh, starting on the 6th which is next week in, in Vancouver and uh, so we will have for now his cabinet in their current positions, in the positions that they're going to be in for the next little while. And the other thing the straight swap allows him to maintain is that is that gender parity gender in, in the cabinet, uh, which uh, has been important to this government. And simply m moving two ministers from portfolios, you don't lose any representation in the province uh, where you, these ministers are from, and you don't lose any uh, you know women around the cabinet yeah. table. And so that that ratio stays the same. You could argue in cabinet making this was an easy switch because it didn't involve having to bring in, uh, you know, regional representation. He could switch to Ontario ministers, and as you say, uh, in terms of gender balance, he could switch to to uh, to female, to women ministers. So it, it's a it was a relatively easy solution, a relatively easy fix that he had to make uh, today and to help out uh, Philomena Tassi in what is obviously a challenging family situation. Uh, so people will now be hearing more about Helena Jacek uh, in this role because it's a far more prominent role uh, than the role she had as Minister of, uh, for the Agency for Economic Development for Southern Ontario. And I'll show you a microphone that we uh, are, have standing by outside of Rideau Hall. Uh, we'll show you in the next few minutes. We expect the Prime Minister and uh, we're told the ministers to arrive at this microphone where they'll uh, uh, perhaps make a statement but also be ready to take questions from reporters. But 
uh, you know, Helena Jacek, uh, looking at, uh, there was a lot of people that looked at Helena Jacek when she was first elected uh, as, as cabinet material, uh, given her, her past, uh, and uh, she is in a minor cabinet portfolio, but uh, looking at her, at her background, uh, what do you think the strengths mm -hmm. she brings to this, uh, this department of procurement, which has had a lot of problems in the yeah. past and is now completely uh, ramped up, and as you talked about mm -hmm. a couple of, uh, you know, uh, Key issues, uh, mm -hmm. more more significant in many ways to uh, you know the, the everyday lives of Canadians, the continued procurement of of medicines and vaccines, mm -hmm. uh, as we talk about and continue to discuss, you know, potential additional waves of COVID. Well, it's interesting too because Helena Jacek's political experience is is fairly extensive. I mean, eleven years in the uh, the Dalton McGuinty and the Wynn governments. She was defeated in two thousand eighteen in a provincial election uh, by a, a federal politician who ran provincially, Paul Calandra, who was a Harper a cabinet minister or a senior Harper a member of the front bench. Uh, he defeated her in two thousand eighteen. She then ran uh, in the riding of Jane Philpot in two thousand nineteen. Jane Philpot, former Liberal minister, former Liberal, who ran as an independent, and Helena Jacek defeated. Jane Philpott in 2019. She was elected to the House of Commons. And as you say, the, the expectations were that she would get some uh, sort of cabinet uh, position. Uh, she was named to cabinet in 2021 with this uh, federal uh, agency for the development of Southern Ontario. But a lot of political experience, and as you mentioned, both health and economic experience, uh, and a lot of political chops. So she, she's gonna, she'll fit in this, in this particular role. And presumably she's had a, uh she has a voice around the cabinet table and that voice may be uh, to some extent amplified and given that past experience and given what we've seen as the uh, the debate in this country she's a former minister of we touched on minister of health and long-term care in the province of ontario we know uh, the kind of conversation that doug ford is leading around uh, in, in additional you know, leading certainly one of the uh, more vocal premiers in the country yeah. but the need for more federal money pumped into health care with no strings attached uh, she becomes a, perhaps a more valuable asset yeah. in a more prominent role that involves uh, perhaps yeah. at some point you know procurement for supplies that yeah. provinces might need she brings that you know wealth of background from her Ontario experience not just at uh, the provincial political yeah. level but she's worked in the hospital system yeah. uh, she's been at the ground level so she uh, she brings that you know, additional experience, whether to a conversation that's getting more and more important in the country. And it's ironic too, because the parallels, her having defeated Jane Philpott, Jane Philpott was a practicing and well-respected physician, but also a practicing and well-experienced health administrator. And uh, Helena Jacek also brings, uh, as a practicing physician, as well as a health uh, economics uh, expert in terms of administering. And as you mentioned, uh, procurement, uh, we saw with Anita Anand, Anand the former procurement minister, uh, a lot of people didn't think of procurement and government public services and procurement uh, in the medical and in the health field. But uh, now with transfers, the argument about transfers to the provinces, uh, during the pandemic we saw literally hundreds of millions of dollars of spending, uh, a lot of it in vaccines and PPE and equipment. Uh, and that is going to be one of the ways that the Trudeau government is going to be transferring funding to the uh, to the provincial governments, and that is through direct purchasing and through transfer of resources. And that's been one of the arguments in this debate about health care transfers, is that the Trudeau government during the pandemic has argued that we have given you 80 80 to 90 percent of our expenses, especially in procurement, have been uh, in uh, the, the healthcare field, and and the provinces have benefited by it. So, as you see, as you mentioned, she will be uh, as part of those discussions in terms of healthcare transfers uh, as the, uh, public, the public services and procurement minister. As we stand by to wait uh, for the prime minister, and uh, a brief, we are told, uh, conversation with reporters to take place outside of uh, Rita Hall uh, in the next few minutes here. Uh, cabinet shuffle taking place in the last 20 minutes. Minor cabinet shuffle, uh, Philomena Tassi moves from the uh, portfolio of uh, procurement and public services to the Agency for um, Economic Development of Southern Ontario. And here comes, uh, and Helena Jacek moves into procurement. Uh, this decision, a uh, quick shuffle made for health reasons. For, uh, Philomena Tassi and her husband, her husband having suffered two strokes and she's now focused on his care. Let's listen in. I think a number of issues recently when it comes to passports, travel, as well as immigration, but you didn't make any changes to those portfolios today. So why didn't you do a bigger reset to your cabinet to address those issues? It's been less than a year since the last election and our government is working extremely hard every day uh, to support Canadians and to deliver uh, the support necessary. We've seen uh, over the past many months uh, real challenges here in Canada and around the world. 
uh, and our government is focused on working every single day uh, to be there to support Canadians through this difficult time, and that's the hard work we're going to continue doing. Next question. Okay. It's been less than a year now since the last election, and our government is working very hard every day to deliver for Canadians. We do recognize that there are a lot of challenges throughout the world and here in Canada, but we're there to work and to bring about the improvements necessary to deliver for Canadians in a time, uh, indeed, of great challenges in the world and in Canada. Next question, uh, TVA. The provinces uh, like Quebec are demanding billions of uh, supplementary trans health transfers in such a context. What do you think that Mr. Legault, uh, about Mr. Legault announcing uh, tax cuts of billions of dollars? As I've said from the beginning, and as we demonstrated during the pandemic, the federal government is there to support the provinces and uh, the health care systems throughout the country. We invested more than $70 billion over and above the usual expenditures uh, during the pandemic and uh, we said we will be there to invest some uh, more in health care but we know full well that it's not only a question of more money we also have to have the results that Canadians need concrete results for Quebecers say and these are the conversations that we're having there's just too many people that don't have a family doctor too many people are waiting too long for a certain uh, mental health services, for example, will be there with uh, more investments, but we have to be able to reassure Canadians uh, that all the investments we make, that they be at the federal or provincial, will deliver real concrete results, real improvements in the healthcare system, and these are discussions that we will be holding. But uh, should one uh, be asking for billions of dollars while giving out billions of dollars in your hand? That's a question for Mr. Legault to answer. You sat down with the Premier of Ontario yesterday. We understand health care was probably a prominent topic in that conversation. Canadians are extremely concerned about the state of their health care system. When is this impasse between the federal government and the provinces over funding going to end? I would suggest that there's not really an impasse right now because I demonstrated, we demonstrated through the pandemic, the federal government was there to step up with over $70 billion in additional funding for health care. And I've been saying consistently, and we've always had the position that yes, we will be there for more investments in healthcare. But I think all Canadians know that it's not just a question of putting more money into the system, it's a question of making real improvements in the system. Canadians need better access to family doctors. Canadians need lower wait times for surgeries, for mental health supports. There are solutions that need to be brought forward that are on the delivery of health care, that we are going to be working with the provinces because they have the expertise, they have the responsibility, but Canadians need results. So yes, we will be there with more investments in health care, but we need to be able to demonstrate to Canadian, Canadians that those results are going to be tangibly delivered for them. Next question, Christian Noël, Radio Canada. If Quebec comes back after the election uh, uh, to a GNL Quebec project, is this something you will be discussing with the German Chancellor next week? This is liquid natural gas. So, so for any project of this nature, uh, there is environmental evaluation or another. There's a full regulatory process that's very important there. The original project of uh, GNL Quebec didn't uh, go through any environmental assessment processes. The ones of the Quebec province I'm referring to. So it never even came up to the federal level. So obviously, we uh, all accept the decision that, that uh, made in Quebec that it isn't the right project uh, for the environment. If people want a, 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 a new project or a different project, well, it has to go through all the regulatory procedures uh, uh, in Quebec at, and at the federal level if necessary. But I'm not going to uh, <coughs> go up no limb uh, uh, to talk about the results of processes that have not been undertaken on a project that isn't even set up. We talked about uh, natural gas with Germany. Yes, we did. But what we've always said is, listen, listen we'll do everything we can to help you out in the short term, mid term and long term. But there's two things here. We have regulatory processes for all of these uh, processes that have to be followed through on. And there's also the issue of 
uh, is there a good business case? Can uh, is the G Germany really need that, that uh, natural gas? That, that uh, uh, in the next, uh, that would only be available in the next decade and not in the next couple of winters uh, where the need is greater. So we've had conversations, but there's still a lot of uh, conversations that are necessary between the different partners. David Aiken, Global News. Good morning, Prime Minister. Ministers, good luck with your new roles. Question for you, Prime Minister. Uh, there's the stories that a, uh, Canadian intelligence services paid um, a so called spy informant this, uh, for information combating ISIS. This particular informant was involved in smuggling women, including a Canadian girl apparently, into ISIS territory to be ISIS brides. I wonder if you think that's appropriate that intelligence services were paying somebody? And then secondly is apparently Cana the Canadian government and the British government has basically conspired to cover up this information for the last five years, and that must concern you. Uh, obviously, we know we live in a particularly dangerous world. Uh, the fight against terrorism requires our intelligence services to continue. Uh, to be flexible and to be creative in their approaches, but every step of the way they are bound by strict rules, uh, by principles and values that Canadians hold dear, including around the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, uh, and we expect that those rules be followed. Um, I know there are uh, questions about uh, certain uh, incidents or, or operations of the past, and uh, we will ensure to, uh, uh, to follow up on those. Next question. Uh, good morning, Prime Minister Paige Parsons with CBC News. Um, to follow up on David's question, are you concerned about whether our intelligence agency, which does not have formal overseas remit, went too far in recruiting an ISIS facilitator and then covering it up? And will you commit to a full accounting of what happened? Um, our intelligence services are subject uh, to rigorous rules uh, and principles that they need to abide by, including uh, upholding the values, the principles, uh, the laws of Canada, um, and there are rigorous oversight mechanisms that are in place that with the clearances necessary to look into uh, the operations and the decisions taken by intelligence services in their work to keep Canada and Canadians safe in a very dangerous world. Um, we will continue to ensure that that proper oversight uh, is done and, uh, as necessary, uh, look at further steps uh, if, uh, if necessary. Next question. Good morning, Prime Minister. Ryan Tumulty, National Post. Uh, when Parliament returns in a couple of weeks, Canadians will have been going through a year of inflation now, a year of higher prices at grocery stores, for gas pumps, for everything. Are you concerned and are you going to be offering some new measures to address that inflation? We know that Canadians are facing real challenges with uh, increases in the cost of living, uh, with uh, prices at the pump, prices for groceries, challenges around housing. Uh, and we have, as a government, uh, been there to support Canadians in a range of ways, whether it was increasing the Canada Child Benefit uh, in line with inflation, whether it's uh, moving forward on uh, increasing the OAS for our uh, most elderly seniors, uh, or whether it's moving forward on historic child care agreements that are saving thousands upon thousands of dollars across the country for families with young children already. But we know there's more to do, and we're going to keep doing that. At the same time, we have to remember uh, that the Canadian economy um, has recovered more jobs more quickly than even the U.S. has following the pandemic because Canadians were there for each other. We invested each other. We have historic low unemployment right now. Lots of people have jobs, but there are still real challenges and we're going to continue to do uh, what is necessary to support vulnerable Canadians as we move through forward, uh, taking into account inflation, but also being careful not to do things that will accelerate or exacerbate the in uh, inflation crisis we're facing. Next question. Uh, Alex Ballygall, Toronto Star. Um, just going back to healthcare in your meeting with uh, Premier Ford yesterday, um, he came out of that saying that you guys had agreed that there's an urgent need to address the crisis in healthcare in the province. Um, so I'm wonder wondering if you committed to anything new for the province to help w with what's going on with hospitals, and if you discussed or shared your thoughts with him on any of the proposals they have, like uh, their bill to push uh, to free up space in hospitals by putting people into long-term care homes. As I've always said, I respect that it is uh, to the provinces to deliver health care. Uh, and provinces do it differently across the country, and they uh, have the full remit to make those decisions. But I also uh, reminded the Premier that I am there, uh, that federal government will be there as a partner to ensure 
uh, that Canadians get good, high-quality health care right across the country, including uh, by being there with more funding. Uh, but as the Premier pointed out, uh, it's not a bilateral conversation. There's lots of provinces as people are facing challenges across the country that need to work together, uh, and we will be there for, to do that. But I think everyone understands, and certainly the Premier understands as well, we need to see results for Canadians. We need to show that new monies invested in health care are going to deliver better outcomes for Canadians in a tangible way because that's what people are facing right now as a significant challenge. Next question. Cormac McSweeney with City News. Uh, the Board of Directors at Hockey Canada have released a statement saying they have full support, they're giving their full support to the executive team at Hockey Canada. Your government and uh, many Canadians have been, been demanding change in the organization with suggestions of a change of leadership as well. What's your reaction to the organization sticking with a team that's faced a lot of criticism for its handling of the sexual assault allegations? And is there a scenario in which you would restore federal funding to Hockey Canada if the executive team in place remains in place? You know, I'm not speaking just as a politician now, uh, but as a dad, as a parent, um, we need to have confidence in the kinds of organizations that don't just provide opportunities and activities for our kids, but provide so many role models and heroes to our kids and shape uh, our weekends, uh, our winters, uh, and our country. Making sure that Canadians have confidence in those organizations is a basic need and it's fairly clear that both the government and Canadians in general have lost confidence in the leadership at Hockey Canada and the longer it takes for Hockey Canada to realize that um, the more difficulties they're going to face. En tant que politicien, oui, mais surtout en tant que parent, Yes, as a politician, but as a parent, I know that these organizations are there to offer activities, uh, to train, uh, to apprentice uh, potential uh, hockey stars, uh, to get involved with the community, and to inspire our youth uh, throughout the country. So, but they must have the trust of the population, of the parents whose children they are training and uh, dealing with. It's quite clear that over the last few months, the government, the federal government, and the public has lost their trust in Hockey Canada, the organization. And the longer that uh, the organization doesn't recognize that fact, which is apparently evident, it will continue to not go very well for them because they will still have to deal with a lot of uh, frank questions. I'd like to come back on the, uh, the safety of our politicians and particularly on the solution. There seems to be different uh, uh, vision or perspective uh, around your cabinet table and uh, among various governments in Quebec, for example, where the notion of a bodyguard, of a driver who is trained specifically to protect the premier is very well established. There seems to be some hesitation uh, to actually um, adopt that approach uh, formally. So uh, what is going to be your approach to make sure that you are protecting your ministers? And where do you stand personally on uh, bodyguards? Well, it, this is not a new conversation. We can recall for a number of years now, we've seen uh, Minister McKenna have to deal with, uh, the, with, with problems, harassment. Uh, other parliamentarians have also been accosted on Parliament Hill itself. The uh, notion of uh, security for ministers has been uh, hotly debated for many years. And we are searching for the best solution, but we're exploring quite a few. But yes, of course, there's a difference uh, of opinion rather than anything else. As a Canadian uh, leader, politician, and a simple citizen, 
uh, we are quite proud of the fact that we don't need the level of security that is uh, required in the United States or elsewhere in the wor world. It's really interesting to see, you know, the Minister of External Affairs doing her shopping at Provigo on a Saturday morning. Uh, it, it adds a certain character of strength to our democracy. But nonetheless, we do recognize that political debate is becoming more and more bitter in this country, more aggressive. Uh, citizens, uh, as we see, unfortunately, some of them uh, feel free to uh, proffer threats particularly against women, the women in, par in power, whether it's journalists or, or politicians uh, in government. And this is uh, very disturbing in our democracy. We have to ensure the safety and the security of all of those who wish to serve their country. Otherwise, these bullies will impact directly on a politicians' ability to do their job and represent Canadians. They're going to discourage good candidates from becoming involved in politics. It's everybody's business. And yes, we're examining how we might be able to offer more security, more structured uh, fashion. Uh, th these are expenses we'd like to not have. Uh, there, there are a lot of other uh, needs that need to be satisfied, uh, whether it's health. Or we could also, you know, do something better to uh, control firearms. Uh, uh, call that investments rather than expenses in protecting our uh, politicians. Uh, well, this debate is ongoing. We're, we're dealing with it today, every day. But in the current context, the current uh, milieu has gotten very toxic, online and directly. It, and there's a direct link uh, with how debate goes on in Parliament even, and uh, words that are spoken uh, between and amongst politicians themselves. It's essential that all leaders of all political stripe be united in condemning violence, confrontation, hostility, that they understand how serious it is and not just minimize it. They have to uh, recognize that they also have a responsibility to uh, draw boundaries on this debate and uh, not hinder those who wish to serve the country. You personally, do you think that each minister should have a bodyguard? I think that that is a very personal decision to be made by each individual. The possibility to obtain and offer them is there, no problem. If we take a look at regional differences, I've seen massive differences of opinion between men and women, for example, on the issue. Women are much more vulnerable. They have suffered much more discrimination and they are threatened more often. They, um, a higher level of concern and fear, anxiety, and uh, the, our public safety uh, department is looking at that now. That we demonstrate the strength of our democracy. And part of the strength of our democracy is being able to see you know, the Minister of Defense uh, going shopping on the weekend at a local uh, IGA. We need to be able to have that connection that we've always prided ourselves in of Canadians being able to have proximity to those who represent them. It's been a point of pride for Canada. But the aggressive, bullying, hate-filled tactics of a small number of people is causing us to have to rethink the freedoms that we've had as parliamentarians and as Canadians in a democracy to walk down the street alongside a member of parliament. And it's unfortunate. It really is. But we need to make sure that 
people who are doing their jobs and serving their communities and serving their country, including at the highest levels, feel safe in the job that they're doing, aren't worried for their families, aren't worried that they're putting at risk their loved ones because they are serving their communities, either as journalists or as politicians. There's a huge reflection we have to have about the kind of country we want to be. And to understand that the tone of our democracy, the tone of our political debates is set by those politicians who get sent to Ottawa to represent their communities. And if there isn't clear condemnation of the kind of cowardly bullying we've seen, of the kind of hate-filled rants and violent words used against people to say this has no place in our democracy. We can disagree and we need to disagree with each other on policies, on perspectives. That's a robust debate that has to happen amongst Canadians to make sure we're getting it right as a collective, as a country. But to limit the ability of women of racialized Canadians to serve in government or to hold government to account as journalists, which is the goal of a number of Canadians with very loud voices, well, that's something all parliamentarians and all leaders need to stand against, need to be unequivocal in being responsible leaders to say no we are not going to become that toxic, polarized country that some think we should become. We need to keep listening to each other, we need to keep standing up for each other, but we need to be respectful of our political opponents. For sure. Um, certainly, I echo, obviously, what the Prime Minister has said. Uh, I go shopping in my neighborhood, and people recognize me, and it is one of the, the best connections that I have with my constituents. And I don't want to be intimidated in any way from uh, missing out on those opportunities to relate directly to my constituents. I uh, certainly have been subject, uh, especially during the last election, uh, to verbal abuse and somewhat intimidating behavior, but all I can do is just carry on. I just put one foot in front of the other, and it's my desire to maintain those connections uh, with the people that I represent to the extent possible. Thank can, you. can I just ask another? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, I think um, I'd like the opportunity to comment on this. Uh, look, clearly my behavior has changed, and uh, I think, as the Prime Minister has indicated, there's a role for all Canadians here if Canadians don't enter into this dialogue, it's going to get worse and it's going to escalate. If this behavior is accepted as a norm, then we are going to be in a position that's far graver than we're in now. And I think there's a role for all Canadians to play in being vocal about that. As the Prime Minister has indicated, politicians included. I am a strong believer in positive politics. I have engaged in positive politics since the time I was elected in 2015. And you know what, folks? Positive politics works. We can change the decorum in the House by ensuring that every response that we have is a positive one. No room for insults, for low blows, for uh, aggressive behavior. And so I think it starts with us. Uh, because we know that we do not, because the gravest thing here is that we are going to have people, as the Prime Minister has indicated, we will not have people stepping up to enter political life, to serve as journalists, because they're afraid for themselves, and maybe even graver, they're concerned for the safety of their family. And that's the situation. It's a sad reality. So we need to act. So I'm very grateful for that question. Can I just uh, follow up on that for both ministers? Minister Tess, you said that you changed your behavior. Yes. Would you like to have either a driver that is trained and armed or just one person that will be essentially like a security personnel? And Minister, I'm going to say your name wrong, Minister Jacek, I'm sorry. Um, 
you want to keep that contact with the public, and, and that's a, um, a, a valid point, but I wonder, just having one person with you, I'm not sure how that prevents you from going to the IGA or talking with your constituents. So can you just elaborate on, on that, both of you, please? So I think that the measures are very important, and we have taken measures that do provide for greater uh, comfort, um, but those measures are not the solution. I can't have somebody, <clears throat> excuse me, by my side 24-7. That's not the answer. When I'm walking out to water the, the garden or to chat with a neighbor or to walk the dog or to take a walk with my son, that's not the answer. The answer is this behavior has to be ended. And I think we can do that if we work together to have Canadians step up and say that this is unacceptable. You can advocate and represent constituents' views and advocate and be very strong in um, political representation. And the, you know the best way to do that is by a smart, intelligent argument, not through uh, insults and, uh, and accusations. So although I do appreciate measures are important, and yes, they provide some level of, of safety and security, monitoring our homes, for example, with cameras, but at the end of the day, that's not gonna be enough. We have to go beyond that and, in, and really encourage Canadians to step up and say, folks, this isn't, this isn't acceptable. And it's going to take us and, and, and result in grave consequences if we don't do that. Well, I certainly echo Minister Tassi's comments. This is unacceptable behavior. It's not Canadian behavior. Um, it's, uh, it's surprising. I think perhaps we're seeing more of this type of aggressive intimidation because of what we've been through over the last couple of years. I mean, COVID-19 has certainly taken a toll on everyone, not just from the health impact, obviously, of those uh, who have succumbed or suffered uh, from the illness, but also in terms of our inability to interact with each other uh, normally, um, socially, and so on. Uh, but, you know, when you're confronted with a bully, what, what do you do? You stand up, you, you, you give your point of view. Um, it's not an argument, it's simply a, a question of stating your beliefs. And uh, Minister Tassi has said it extremely well. Um, that's what I've done. Uh, I've been in public life for a number of years. And at the end of the day, people tend to back down. Now, on the actual personal protective side, I'm sure you know we are all issued with devices that we can press uh, that bring uh, protective services, local police uh, to our aid if necessary. Uh, and uh, that's of a certain amount of reassurance. Uh, but I think just simply standing up to bullying behavior is something that uh, is essential that we all uh, do, and that's the way I conduct myself. Merci beaucoup. C'est ce qui m'a fait à la conférence de presse d'aujourd'hui.